six music today from two jimmy big nuts from midday mandy tidbits but now it's adam and joe hello and welcome to the big british castle it's time for adam and joe to broadcast on the radio there'll be some music and some random talking in between and then eventually That's Junior Mervyn there with Police and Thieves. Hey, this is Adam. Hey, this is Joe. Welcome to the Adam and Joe radio show here on BBC Six Music on a beautiful Saturday morning here in London, anyway. London town. Ooga booga. Ooga booga. Your chimney's filthy, darling. I'll be over later on to clean it. Is that all right? I've got a couple of mussels here for you, if you like. Eels. Would you like some? We live in London. Eels. Eels. We got lots of stuff coming up in the show, listeners. You may have heard just there one of our new idents at the very, very top of the show, right before even the big British castle jingle. That's a new bit of branding that's come through from the top. Yeah. From the We're going to be top. playing that again? Well, we've got a few variations on the theme. So listen out. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't draw attention to it, otherwise we'll get locked up in the, in the vault. We'll explain more about that later. We've also got um, a special Black Squadron command. Mm. Black Squadron, of course, are the elite listening force who are listening live at the moment. If you're listening to this live rather than on Listen Again or the podcast, then you are by default a member of Black Squadron. Yeah, you've tuned in for the first half hour of the program. That means that you're, you know, you're the hardcore, the elite. Now, we've been giving Black Squadron commands, and last week there was a certain amount of um, negative comments about the whole black squadron what? phenomenon last week was the most uh, heart stirring wonderful it was amazing in the end it really came through the pan hats they were really powerful and moving and incidentally if you want to see some of those pan hats you can visit our blog bbc.co.uk forward slash blogs forward slash adam and joe are they on the blog no they're on the website the, the adam and joe website they're there somewhere if you dig around this week we are going to step things up a bit. What were the negative comments? Well, I thought you were suggesting that it was a bit silly. That, oh. That, that Black Squadron was a, was a bit silly negative and Negative comments and from me? Kind of. No. Just in a fun way, Adam. Don't yeah, worry. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not getting at you seriously. Just, just playful. So I decided to step up uh, Black Squadron this week. Yeah. And I think we should focus on... <laughs> <laughs> there you go again, you see. <laughs> That's exactly what I was talking about. Oh, negative that. comments. Oh, you mean yeah. that kind of thing? wasn't really a comment, though, was it? That, you mean that sort of thing? It's just a ne- <laughs> negative squadron. noise. Right. Listen to that squadron. <laughs> you, you're going to turn the squadron against you. That could, be. that could be bad. That is negative, isn't it? You're playing with fire. See, I didn't mean it. It just comes out. Maybe it sounds negative. Anyway, anyway carry on. What are you thinking? Can you uh, hear? Like last week, we did pan hats, and uh, people sent us some amazing photographs, and they sent them in very fast. So we figured, why not have a Black Squadron photo race? Ah, good idea. That's what we're going to do this morning. So Black Squadron, stand by with any kind of... Uh, you've got to be able to email or text this photo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so stand by with your camera or your camera phone. And we're going to give you a command that is kind of an instruction of a particular sort of photo we want you to take. Ooh. Right? And so we, they need the details for where to send it, right? Yeah. So you can email it to Adam and Joe dot six music at bbc dot co dot uk or you can text it to six four oh four six that's right and texts will be charged at your standard yes. message rate joe and it's not purely what we're not going to kind of um that there is no winner right it's not a competition it's not a competition no how stupid <laughs> competition it is merely a what is it then it's a fun game a <laughs> fun game and uh, we will put our favourite and best photo, the one that makes us laugh the most, on the blog. Yeah. So that's what's up for grabs, if you could say there's something up for grabs, but of course there isn't, because no, it's not it's, a competition. No, it's a fun speed no, 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 game. No, 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 fun no. speed photo a game. fun speed photo game. <laughs> so, stand by, because I'm going to give you the uh, description of what you've got to photograph. It's very simple. Be careful while you're doing it. Don't break anything. Don't get overexcited. It's not necessarily the fastest. It's the fastest and the best. And the know? most fun. And the most fun. Are we going to do that now, then? Yeah. All right. Uh, let me tell you that as soon as Joe issues the command, we're going to bang right into the next track. It's going to be by the phenomenal hand clap band. It's called 15 to 20. But now, here is the command for Black Squadron. All right, Black Squadron, stand by with your cameras. We would like you to take a photo of a poltergeist attack. 
Is this a is that a poltergeist? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at some of the squadron pictures there. Is that a poltergeist? <laughs> That's a furry owl. That's a very vivid apparition of a poltergeist, if it is one. <laughs> <laughs> poltergeist has never been captured so clearly. Well, the, the, the light there looks as if it might be an apparition of right, some kind. Right, right. Well, very interesting interpretations of the Black Squadron command have come in already. We're just having a, a look through them. If you've just tuned in, we were asking Black Squadron to take photographs of a poltergeist attack. Mm. And there have been some terrifying occurrences all over Britain in the last three or four minutes Photos are coming in hand over fist. We'll keep you up to date. Oh, this is a good one. Look at that one. A man in his pants. Oh, that's good. Look at that. That's really good. That's almost uh, what the Victorian. Heck? He's got black pants on. <laughs> the listeners. pants are the most terrifying He's aspect just of in that his, picture. He's standing nude apart from his black <laughs> pants in his kitchen. And he's, it looks as if he's wrestling with a sheet that's fallen from the ceiling. That's really, that's frightening. I mean, a man is at his most vulnerable when in black wife fronts and nothing else. Stay away from my pants! <laughs> that's a good picture, I like that. That's a very good it's picture. blurry. Oh, that's a contender. Well, you've got another quarter of an hour, listeners, to send these in before... Right, the uh, deadline is, is half past nine. But, you know, that has an advantage because of its speed. That is, yeah. The faster they come in the more chance they have, right? That's right. But it's not purely speed, it's quality as well. And fun. And fun. So you're probably wondering how my elbow is. Yes, last week, listeners, Adam was telling us about what he thought was a spider bite on his elbow. It had a huge pustulant swelling on it. It wasn't pustulant. It's like you've got a double, a double, what's that thing called? Elbow. <laughs> well, is there a name for the pointy bit, the pointiest pointy <laughs> bit on the end of the elbow? Elbow. The elbone. The elbone. It looks like you've got a swollen elbone. I do. I feel like that's I've got an good, extra sorry, protrusion. That's quite a good word, isn't it? Elbone. Elbone, yeah. yeah. That's the kind of word that children use. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like eyebrow. Yeah. Did you used to think they were called eyebrow? I should have texted that in for the text the nation a couple of weeks ago. Body part names. Ah, elbone. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got an extra elbone now, as you pointed out. Yeah, on my right elbow. And it's sort of peeled as if it's sunburned. You've lost a bit of skin there, mate. I know, mate. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it's all, I mean, it's still painful, but it's a little bit better than it was last week oh good i went we the... got some sorry to uh, no carry on. we got some very alarming emails from listeners oh really people who'd had similar elbow problems we got a lot of medical advice a lot of doctors mm. uh, actually offering you bits of text describing how you should operate on yourself well they were assuming that it was some form of bursitis or something that's right and how to burst and drain it the bursa and I, it wasn't like that it wasn't purulent in that no. way it wasn't weeping or seeping it was just kind of painful and swollen yeah. but then i went to the uh sort of a and e like the local medi center when i got back on saturday last week after the show because i was in absolute agony mm. and i went there, i booked myself an appointment and i actually thought it was the doctor i thought it was the local doc right right i turn up and it's more like the medi center and it's really full saturday night loads of people their families little kids and stuff and it was the one time in my life when i did not want to be recognized right which doesn't happen to me very often but sure enough as soon as i go in there this guy goes oh hello <laughs> look who it is <laughs> <I said. laughs> was this a, the doctor saying that no this the receptionist the this was a guy waiting to a have patient his, he had a problem with his eye to have his brain removed he's like what are you doing here no he was a nice chap what are you doing here i was like well i'm, I'm in agonizing pain and i'm uh, feeling really ill thanks what are you doing oh i've got something in my eye so <laughs> oh weird to see you here i was just uh checking out some of your stuff on the internet uh crystal maze I didn't want to go into the fact that that was Joe that did that one, mm. but uh, although I did help with the voices, and uh, so I said, "Oh yeah, great, that's great, really great." So, uh, weird, weird to have you uh, sat here, a celebrity, sort <laughs> of. He said, sort of, yeah, sort of. Correct. Meanwhile, everyone in the waiting room was like watching. Uh, this little scene unfold and sort of thinking who's that guy talking to <laughs> what? who's the guy with the beard he's not famous it was really awful so and then i said to him like how long have you been waiting here he's like, oh about an hour now my appointment was about an hour ago an hour i'm not gonna wait an hour and make small talk with my agonizing pain so i just peeled off couldn't be bothered with it really yeah i thought i don't care life's too short I can go home and be in pain in bed rather than sat here in the But you didn't center. get your elbow treated? No, because I thought, what are they going to say? They're going to go, well, you know, it's, you just got a big elbow. It'll go down. Get and, over and it. And it has gone down. And it has, yeah. Wow. So I, uh, I correctly diagnosed myself. I went straight home to bed. How serious would the injury have to be 
before you stop being repelled by celebrity recognition. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, I, I think there would have to be an open gash there. Right. That actually needed to sewing up by a professional. Something that would get you rushed through the waiting room. I mean, even an open gash, at that moment, even an open gash, I would have gone home and done it myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stuck a little band-aid on it. Self-surgery. Uh, right now, listeners, I've got a free play for you. This is a band that I met in Latitude, the Latitude Festival. Hey, man. Yeah. Can I just um, give credit to the guy whose photo we just described? Yeah, Because sure. we were talking about it. Black and Pants then, Man. And then we failed to give him credit, but now I've lost the, I've lost the picture. Thanks for interrupting Sorry, sorry, my I had it positioned up, but now play. someone's... For this total dead. time-wasting so rubbish! I can't find it anymore! So talk again and I'll interrupt you again. I met this band in Latitude. Where is it? They're called Skylarkin. James, where's it gone? Like... Not Skylarking, but Larkin, Sky Larkin like, like Philip, Philip Larkin. Larkin. Maybe it's a reference to the band XTC's Why's album it Sky. Shut up! I think he was called Ian. Jim. Jim. He was called Jim. Jim what? Jim and Ree Edwards. Jim and Ree Edwards. Yeah, their, their their photo was of Jim in his pants. Right. Yeah. Sorry about that. Keep going. And this is a track from their album The Golden Spike. Uh, very much enjoying this album, and it's called Fossil Eye. Well, it is Phoenix Consolation Prizes. Yes. The song is like a kind of a croissant made of joy. A joy croissant made of sunshine as well. A pastry made of sunshine. A fair a pastry made of happy. You just said the word pastry. Le pastry joyeux. Le pastry joyeux. Listen, it's been an extraordinary half hour of powerful supernatural activity across Britain. Mm. I mean, it's like the beginning of Ghostbusters 2. Right. You know? When they all break mm. through the, um... Mm. Mm. Concrete. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the middle of Ghostbusters 2. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, brilliant photos. Dave in Barrow has sent a terrifying picture of some sort of little black beast at the top of the stairs with oh. fiery glowing eyes yeah he's got a brilliant picture of like the main uh, main staircase and then just in the corner at the very top is this little black cat peeping around but then the flash is reflecting in its eyes making it look demonic that's yeah. really good for such short notice photo taking some of the photos are absolutely brilliant you james could, Binning, you could exhibit them at the royal academy in london he sent a brilliant uh, oh, photo of ectoplasm spewing from his mouth Oof. or a napkin not sure. Ruby Styles and her dad, Tony, uh, have taken a terrifying picture of Ruby talking to a blank television screen. That's a very good one. That's a good one. And she's blonde as well. Very like good. Like little girl in pol Poltergeist. This one? It's very hard to take a picture of white noise on television, though, you know, because you get the, the, sc the screen... You get Derek Jarman's blue now. Yeah. That's the default colour. That's right. Mm-hmm. Exactly, in the digital age. It's an absolute shame. There's so many great photos, listeners. It's going to take a while to go through them all and make our decision. But I think what we'll do is rather than announce the... not, It's not a winner, is yeah. it? How would you describe the one that we select? Um, the champion. The ra no, because that implies, that implies some kind of better. winning. The randomly selected, non-superior representative. The pleasing representative. Yes. The non-superior pleasing representative. The democratic indicator. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. random democratic indicator of voter. randomly selected pleasingness. The, the mean image. <laughs> well, that makes it sound negative, though. No, as in mathematically mean, the average. I see what you yeah, mean. the representative. Anyway, we'll do that and we'll stick it on the, on the blog, bbc.co.uk forward slash blogs forward slash Adam and Joe. We'll do that like on, uh, well, after the show. Coming up in the next half hour, ladies and gentlemen, we have Retro Textonation. We are going to be reading out a few more messages that we got about last week's Textonation subject, which was most annoying TV presenting things or presenters themselves. We've had quite a few messages coming in on that subject, so we're going to be doing that and uh, playing more great music, etc. A little bit like this. This is the Sundays with Summertime. That's the Sundays with Summertime. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Very nice to have you along. This is uh, Adam and Joe. <laughs> I just said all that, didn't I? It's just gone 9.30. I'm going mental. It's time for the news. That's the Battle of Who Could Care Less by Ben Folds 5. Hey, how you doing, listeners? This is Adam. Hey, I'm Joe. Welcome to the Adam and Joe radio show here on BBC Six Music. Nice to have you along. Now, it's a lovely sunny day outside, and it's been nice all week, in fact. Nice. Sometimes, right, in September, you get, like, the nicest weather of the whole year. That is true. Because it's mm. nice, it's, like, sunny, right, but it's also yeah, 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 not yeah, too hot. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you don't get uncomfortable. 
I've said this before, right? Yeah, say it again. Summer in Britain yes. is at the beginning and end, not in the middle. Right. You know? It's always bad in the middle. <laughs> By, Do you know what I mean? It's hot at the beginning of the summer, and it's always rubbish in the right, middle, and then yes. it gets hot again at the end. And it gets nice again at the end. It's always the same. But the thing I noticed this week, walking around London town, I was here for a couple of days doing a little bit of work, you know, how it goes. Exciting for you. Very exciting. Did you get confused and overwhelmed? Yeah, I started crying. <laughs> I was like the guy from Alone in the Wild. <laughs> we'll talk about that later on. But I noticed a lot of people sitting outside restaurants. Oh, God! On tables on the pavement. Why do they do that? Why? I'm asking you. Why, well, why do they not? do that? Because they're sitting outside in the pavement in England at the end of September. And it just seems to be like a colossal act of denial to me. Mm. You know what I mean? Well, it's becoming a, Euro- a European style it's city. It's not a European style. It is. Everyone's style cycling. Please. It's very <laughs> relaxed now. <laughs> European style. It's by no means European style. You've got a great big ugly street like Oxford Street or whatever, and there's mm-hmm. still people sitting outside. I disagree. I think it's lovely. You're insane. <laughs> Have you ever sat outside in a. I know what you mean when the pavement's very narrow, and not even when, when the traffic's narrow. very close. And when there are loonies coming and asking you for money, mm-hmm. or if I'm sitting eating at a table, table, I always think that someone will walk past. And in fact, I'm vaguely tempted to do this when I'm walking past someone's table. It'd be an awful thing to do, and I'd never do it. <laughs> but just to put your fist in their chips. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're just strolling past. They've got a bowl of chips. You go, boom, fist in the chips. Punch the chips. Boom. Fist in chips. Yeah, or something like that. Or I don't know, or just... um knock their drink over and run away (laughs) do you know what i mean there just seems to be a sort of very fragile sense of uh an unspoken (laughs) sense of trust having a very fancy (laughs) meal especially when it's one of those restaurants when there's a tablecloth and roses and and it's as if they're in a room you're not in a room mate you're in the street that's the thing i think like you're just walking by and there's dog pops and strewn around and stuff and and bins overflowing i think the general idea is is wonderful of course the idea is one but but it's a world away from being (laughs) on sunset it boulevard in most as the sun goes down but sunset you know. boulevard's horrible as well there are lots of uh, there are lots of outdoor restaurants on sunset boulevard and that's really traffic but some of them have little white fences around them and stuff yeah like that, but know? that's just as bad there i agree it's a little bit i don't agree you don't agree no i started off wow. agreeing now i don't <laughs> agree complete switcheroo i don't put my fist in the chips though you don't well no neither do i but i'm i'm tempted to <laughs> what else? i don't know i don't know you often get hassled by um people asking for money though don't you right don't you? It's certainly in Soho if you, you're sitting I, out. I don't know. I've never sat out. I've never been tempted. Oh, to me, yeah. it seems insane. Right, like, here's some other things you could have, right? <laughs> the same kind of things. Mm. Like, what about a shower in a supermarket? <laughs> yes, a shower in a soup. Well, where's the through line there? How is that like eating on the pavement? Oh, I see. Well, it is a bit, isn't it? Because to you, the incongruity <laughs> right. of pavements exactly. and eating. Right, exactly. Okay. I get it. What about a bed on a tube train? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this could go on forever. Couldn't yeah, it? That's it. Yeah, good. I mean. uh, what about a cocktail bar in a public toilet? How about mm, that? Mm, you want to hang mm, out there? Mm, yeah. Fist and chips? <laughs> what about a swimming pool in a cinema? <laughs> oh, for God's sake. <laughs> It's too broad. Or a gym in a restaurant. <laughs> it's too... The parameters aren't strict enough. How about a gymnasium right there in the restaurant? <laughs> what do you mean the parameters aren't strict? It's just too... It's too floppy and broad. Mm-hmm. You want to tighten the terms up a bit. Really? Then it'll be more impressive. Comically. <laughs> hmm. Try not. Um, laundry on a bus? Mm. Is it not the same? No. Should we play some music? What's Fanfarlo? I don't know. We're going to find out in a second. This is called The uh, Walls Are Coming Down by Fanfarlo. <laughs> That's Fanfarlo. We don't actually know where they're from, but we're assuming they're sort of European, right? Mm, Scandinavian or something. There's a photo of them here. They're making a little human pyramid. There's making a human pyramid in the garden, a nice garden of maybe their mother or someone like that. One, two, three, four, five men. One Fun lady. Farlo. They sound a little bit like, you know, Arcade Fire and... Um, a bit polyphonic spree, I got. Right, right, right. That kind like a of big vibe. communal collective. How mm. many of them are there in the pyramid? Then? Five, I said already, five. There's not five. Can you one, not two, count? One, two, three, four, there's six. <laughs> if I said five men and one lady, six. I can't count, no. <laughs> I can, because I'm Count Buckley's. Well done. Um, this is ba- BBC Six BBC Six Music. Uh, welcome along. Nice to have you here. It's a lovely Saturday afternoon. 
And we are going right now to catch up with Text the Nation in Retro Text the Nation. Oh, this is a disaster. So I'll do it, I'll do it. Introduction, you do it. It's time for Retro Text the Nation. I like to listen to Adam and Joe. But I listen to the podcast, not the live show. I used to feel acute frustration. Because I couldn't join in with Text the Nation. But now my troubles have disappeared Because Retro Text the Nation's here And now my letter might be read out Instead of thrown in the trash and forgotten about What a profoundly stirring jingle to kick off Retro Text the Nation. This is the part of the show that... Uh, oh, and I've lost it now as well. Oh, it's going so well. This is where uh, we read out submissions for last week's Text the Nation subject so that people who've listened to the show on iPlayer and via the podcast can join in. And last week's Text the Nation subject... Why can't I say that? Text the Nation. Last week's Text the Nation subject was all about TV presenting annoyances. Mm-hmm. Uh, TV presenters, techniques or mannerisms that really get on your wick... And we got some furious correspondence, didn't we? People feel very passionately about it. It's something that everyone takes very seriously. And I was worried after last week's show that we'd maybe, you know, been reading out some quite personal insults to other uh, castle presenters. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they weren't our opinions. They were the opinions of our listeners. But people getting really incensed about the minutiae of particular presenters' movements and mannerisms. It's Shan Lloyd. She came in for some fairly harsh criticism. She came in for a lot of kicking. (laughs) It was very personal criticism. The master, the bald master chef presenter (laughs) seems to be one of the most uh, irritating figures in the public sphere at the moment, wouldn't you say? Have you got a few messages there from listeners? We've got more, yes. Here's one from George Humphreys. He says, It really bothers me when people sit too close together on TV. This is best exemplified on the programme This Week, hosted by Andrew Neil. The regular guests, Diane Abbott and Michael Portillo, sit far too close together. It boggles my mind. Why not get a bigger couch? Surely they feel uncomfortable so close to each other's special zones. I imagine that TV presenting is a sweaty business, so sitting with at least 25% of your body area touching is nothing short of madness. So he's getting annoyed by physical proximity on the television. Yeah. He must spend a lot of his life very angry. I know what he means about Diane Abbott and Michael Portillo, though. They mm. do. I've noticed that. And I've, uh, but they have a kind of sexual chemistry anyway, though. They do. Uh, a very special sexual chemistry. Well, that's a sexy program. They're reaching very across laid to back. each other from across the political boundaries. Spectrum. Michael from the right, Diane from the left. Mm. And it's a beautiful meeting of minds in the middle and mm. bodies as well. Mm. It's very sexy. Here's one from Scott. He says, on Bargain Hunt... Cash in the Attic, etc. The presenters and experts, such as Wanacott, Dickinson and Martin, always feel they have to make idiotic puns that relate to the item up for auction. For example, a porcelain figure of a horse would get, let's hope it gallops away at auction. If that's not enough, they're constantly forcing the member of the public to disclose what they plan to do with the money. Surely that's none of their business. There's not a lot you can spend £40 on. It's just an excuse to get a final pun to end the segment. Well, the porcelain horse has ended up in pastures new, and I'm sure the £40 will help towards that trip to Australia to visit your dead father. That's all from us here at the auction rooms in Chiswick. That was from Scott. Thank you very much, Scott. That's well observed. That is very annoying. I mean, the, if you remove puns from the media, though, the whole infrastructure will come tumbling down. Plus, you've got to have some sympathy for those people. They do a one-hour show every day, five days a week, yeah. from different rubbish tips. Or where does it come from? <laughs> <laughs> Places in the UK. Places in the UK. Sorry, but it's like, um, <laughs> isn't that the one that comes from, like, jumble sales or something? Fisting chips. Fist and chips. <laughs> anyway, I've got sympathy. They look so sort of tired and lost. And they've been doing it for f- 15 years so every day. Job. Yeah. Awful job. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my tongues <laughs> being sucked back into my toothless lizard mouth. <laughs> <laughs> 
Here's another one from Nikki in London. I'm sorry, but David Attenborough's nature documentaries drive me insane what? with their obviously created by a Foley artist sounds and manipulative music. No. Look, oh wow, no really, oh wow, this is amazing. A polar bear, and listen, he's crunching custard inside a pair of rubber gloves. <laughs> that's- Actually, that's from Simon Corrigan. I've got two names at the end of that. It's either from Simon Corrigan or Nikki in London. But he or she <laughs> is annoyed by these sound effects. That's a very bold claim. I don't believe mm-hmm. the BBC would fake up sound effects on a nature dog. Oh, of course they do. Attenborough, of course they do that. No uh, they've way. got enough trouble getting the uh, getting the picture without you the are, sound. If they did that, they would have to put. They would have to no, say some ad, sound ad, ad, Come on, created by a foley artist. You're in the biz. Right, if you want to get a polar bear, you don't get close with the camera. You stick it on a long lens. Get a directional mic. Yeah, but not at that distance in the in the polar they in got, polar land when it's windy. They got good mics these days. Pick up lovely clean crunching. Do you think? Or you get a tame bear in afterwards to do it, maybe. But uh, you don't fake up sounds of nature. It's not faking. It it's, is. It's, not, it's just it's just making. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any. One thing I do notice, though, is sometimes when you've got black and white footage on documentaries, especially of the Mm. war, bombs dropping, that kind of thing, which was clearly silent footage, right? Yeah. Then they put, like, mad explosions and stuff. And all that sort of stuff. It's par for the course. Of course Attenborough But not Attenborough. Yeah, he does. No, none. Listeners, support me on this. Support me on this. Dickie, get in touch. Uh, And Richard. Here's one from Luke in Manchester. David. Is what I mean. Do Although you? there are many annoying things about the X Factor, one thing infuriates me beyond reason. In this new series, they have the auditionees sing to a backing track and insist on cutting to a shot of a faceless sound engineer pushing up a fader before the start of each song, as if the audience's brains would incinerate <laughs> at not knowing where this magical Muzak wonder was emanating. The only way me and my girlfriend can bear it is by sarcastically miming the action as it happens to diffuse the rage. We should probably just stop watching it, Luke, in Manchester. Yeah, Have I you know noticed that. that? Definitely, yeah. Do you know what that is, I think? It's like a cue to place your bets. Uh Because you never know whether they're going to be awful or brilliant at that point. And that's the kind of visual clue to say, it's going to be brilliant, it's going to be awful. (laughs) I know what they mean, though. It is a bit ridiculous, just pressing the play button. But it's Mm. a nice visual cue. Mm. I've changed my mind. It's not ridiculous. (laughs) It's brilliant. It's one of my favourite bits of the programme. You're impossible to pin down. I know, I am. Have you got another one? I'm mercurial. Mm. No, you read out one of the ones I had. Oh, have you not got some spare ones? No, I don't. Some overspill ones. Damn you. I've got another one. You can have one of mine. If I'm, you want. I'm happy to listen to yours. I love the sound of your voice. Do you? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know what? I've nearly run out. Oh, here's another one. Miss Fiona Bruce, who we love. Well, yeah. So this is in our opinion. We love you, Fiona. I want Miss to, Fiona yeah. Bruce, you want to what? Have an affair. I was going to say have an affair with her. But with uh, her? Yeah. Really? So do I. Do you? Yeah. Let's, let's not get into no, this. No, I'll, I'll do Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> I can Miss, do any days, she's free. Miss Fiona Bruce seems to have a habit on the news of sitting at the desk with her arms positioned in such a way that she is impersonating a Romulan from Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> it appears that she is wearing a mildly irritating deodorant, Robert from Dumfrieshire. Now, you know about Romulans. <laughs> 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 you like Star Trek. Is that right? Do you know about Romulan? <laughs> I picked that one out specifically. I like Star, of Star Trek: Next Trek Generation. Knowledge. They don't have. There's not that much Romulan action in the that's Next Generation. Point. Do you think that's a fair point? It's more Borg based. Do you think that's a fair point? Though? I don't know. I know more about the <laughs> Borg. If they talked about that, I could comment. Romulans, I'm not fast. All right. Well, that's the end of Retro Text the Nation. I think <laughs> um, a lot of very irrational fury about uh, presenters. Thank you very much indeed for all your messages. Here's a free choice. This is yours, Joe. Yeah, this is a bit of Bert Yanch. Uh, hang on. Where's the piece who, of paper? Who is Bert Yanch? Well, he became a member of Pentangle, didn't he? He's a kind of folk troubadour from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and noughties. He's like the cornerstone uh, of the British folk scene. He kind of is. This is from his eponymous 1965 album. Uh, this is a track called Oh, How Your Love Is Strong. That was Polytechnic with Won't You Come Around. That was taken from their 2007 album, Down Till Dawn. And uh, guitarist, I'm sorry to tell you this, listeners, but guitarist Danny, Denny Hilton left the band in 2007. Oh, God. Um, I'm really sorry about that. The four members left have begun to work on new material, so there's light at the end of the tunnel. But I think everybody was very shocked when Denny left in 2007 and um the rest of the guys mm. found it very difficult to mm. carry on mm. 
but there is going to be um it looks as if there is going to be new material from polytechnic so that's okay i'm, I'm very i'm very sorry it's very unprofessional <sighs> I just wish Teddy would get in touch. <laughs> I remember his, I just, his belt. I don't know where he is in the world. I think about his belt. Why? The belt why? Was. Why did he leave? Why? Why did he go from the band? What's he doing now? That's all. I just wish he would call. Listen, fact check time. Yeah. Right. Fan follower English. Are they? They're not like, well, European, so that we were right. But they're not Scandinavian. No. <laughs> <laughs> also, listen to this, Adam. Go on then. Uh, hi, Adam and Joe. A friend of mine is a dubbing artist. He said that all the sounds we hear on nature programs aren't authentic. They come from a data bank of pre-recorded sounds. Karen from Bristol. Sam in Edinburgh. I'm sorry, Adam, but a great deal, <gasps> if not most of the sound effects on nature docs are done by a Foley artist. You what? My soul withered a little when I found this out, but I got over it. Russell in Brighton. I remember a whole program years ago on a woman whose job was to make the sounds for nature features. A lot of knives and cabbages, I recall. But, uh, but you... Yeah, I'm afraid I you just are can't. wrong. Uh, here's someone. Do definitely create sounds for nature programs, including Attenborough. There have been documentaries about it on the DVDs. How else do you think they got a time-lapsed growing bramble to creak on the plant series? <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's easy to well, get a time-lapsed like growing bramble to creak. <laughs> uh, no, hang on. The end of this uh, text is... How else do you think they got a time-lapsed growing bramble to creak on the plant series, Adam? Return to schooling! <laughs> <laughs> Exclamation I am mark. naive. Certainly, I certainly am naive. But I just assumed that in the modern climate of transparency and accountability, that you wouldn't be allowed to but get there away was a with big, things there like was that. a big fuss about them intercutting like a wide shot of a real squirrel with a close-up of a squirrel. I know nature studio. documentaries are to some extent a tissue of lies, but I assumed that nowadays you had to, like, be completely transparent about it and have, like, Bear Grylls does yeah, at the not beginning of the program. Completely. Well, this is the thing. Is it completely if or it not completely? If it was completely? completely transparent, all nature programs would have to be live. I, like, I'm an advocate. I liked it in the old days when mm. everyone would lie through their teeth about yes. everything on yes. TV. I thought that was much more fun. I didn't care about knowing the truth. I didn't want to know the absolute truth about everything and competitions and all that rubbish. But now, in the modern climate of having mm. to be totally 100% honest about the way everything is done in a tedious way, I can't believe <laughs> that they are getting fake creaks on time-lapse growing brambills. I can't believe you've got over Danny so quickly. <laughs> I can't <laughs> believe you mentioned I mean, him was that again. real? Do you really care about him, or was this, that just, like, fake? Of course I care about him. Yeah. Why would I fake that? You, you can't fake that. About, Danny. Here's a letter from a listener. Uh, this is from Simon Nichols. He's 21, he's male, and he's from Hemel Hempstead. Dear Adam and Joe, I'm a massive fan of the show. I work Saturdays, so I've never been part of Black Squadron, I'm afraid, but I do love the podcast. One of my favourite times to listen to your podcast is when I'm in the bath. I often tell my parents I'm going for my Adam and Joe bath. Uh. I, put my, I put my laptop on the other side of the bathroom and leave a podcast on while I have a nice wash, and then I towel up and shuffle back to my room to finish listening. So this week, I was sitting on my bed, having just returned to my room, and I was listening to the podcast when I spied a whisper gold on my table. Oh. And then he says in brackets, other chocolate bars are available. Mm, mm, so he's doing, the, gold. he's doing the work for us there. Thank you for that. I had just started eating the chocolate when there was a knock at the door. I froze. Suddenly, I realised I was completely naked, eating chocolate, listening to Adam and Joe. My mum, having no concept of the point of knocking, threw open the door and stepped in. You can imagine the embarrassment that ensued. Me sat in front of a laptop, listening to Adam and Joe with a half-eaten choc bar in my hand, eyes like a rabbit caught in the headlights. She simply gasped at my nudity and turned around. As she left the room, I shouted after her, That's right, mum! This is what I do now! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not entirely sure why. We laughed about it later. Thanks much, Sam Nichols. Thanks a lot for that. I just thought I'd read that out as a yeah. nice little image portrait. That's a couple of curious things about that. Your, how old is that man? 21. 21. Your mum seeing you naked at 21? Is that slightly odd? Yeah, very odd. Uh, odd. So when was the last time your mum saw you naked? Well, not for a very long time. Do you think there should be a national nude day? No. 
You don't. You don't. You don't think so? You don't think it would clear up a lot of mysteries? Oh no, I don't want. Those are the mysteries I don't want. Come to up. work nude? No thanks. Do you think? Why not? Are you afraid of something? No. I Have think... you got something to hide? What? Saggy butox? Yes, of course. Man breasts. Obviously, like I've got something bottles. to hide. I don't want to walk around nude. If I was some kind of Adonis, not like Lord Adonis, who cruelly is rather an unattractive man, but I. <laughs> You should go on Mock the Week. I would be. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> you know, if I was sexy, of course I'd walk around nude. This is nonsense. Let's play some more music. This is the, the hang on. What? 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 The other thing is that's an ambitious bath. Laptop in the in the bath. No, he made a point of saying he puts it at the other end of the bathroom. I was talking to someone on the phone, uh, and he was on the phone in the bath with his laptop in the bath. What? That's ambitious, that's isn't it? Irresponsible. It got me thinking. What's the most ambitious you've ever been with a bath? Ambitious. Do you know what I mean in terms of stuff to do in there? Well, like put a, a little mini hadron collider in there. Or yeah. Something. Other than wash. <laughs> oh, what's the most ambitious? That's a good question. Trying to multitask in the bath. Cause, sure. I, you know, I've never used my laptop in the bath. I'd be terrified that well, the steam would idiot hole if you break it. Yeah, but people do. That's moronic. Anyway, I'm just what... Interesting question, though. Things you've done in multitasking in the bath. We'd love to hear your thoughts, listeners. <laughs> 64046 <laughs> is the text. And you can email us, Adam and Joe, uh, dot six music at bbc.co.uk. Here's some great music. This is in Spiral Carpets. <laughs> that was the In Spiral Carpets with This Is How It Feels. That was an accurate evocation of how it feels to be lonely, Joe. Really? Yeah, and how it feels when your life means nothing at all. Oh, God. Uh, this is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. I think it's time that we got into this week's Text the Nation. Here's the jingle. Text the Nation. Text, text, text. Text the Nation. What if I don't want to? Text the Nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. Now, I'm a small man, listeners. A small, hairy, angry man. And I tend to get into confrontations with authority on a fairly regular basis. I've spoken before on this program about confrontations that I've had with parking wardens. Incidentally, I heard this sketch on the Mitchell and Webb sound on Radio 4 this week, which was kind of a bizarre apologia, is that the word, for parking wardens. The premise of the sketch was like some guy going in and having a meeting, and he was a parking warden, and it was a meeting in uh, the ministry of having to stick up pointlessly for your job or something like that. And so it started off with him saying, you know, all the obvious things that are annoying about parking wardens, and the panel was saying, you know, what's the point of your job? And then he basically listed all the useful things about parking wardens. Was and, that David Mitchell? Uh, it was, well, it was both of them. Right. And it was all the, I mean, I don't know who the sketch was written by, <laughs> but it was just a big long list of why you do need parking restrictions. That sounds like a Mitchell sketch to me. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. the way he thinks. Because he gets, presumably gets irritated by people moaning about parking wardens. And he goes, well, actually, you know, they're doing an important job. But I just thought, obviously, they're doing an important job. Yes, you need parking restrictions. The reason people get in rucks with uh, these kinds of people is generally because in specific instances, they're behaving mm. like mm. toilet bowls. Mm. And you get very frustrated and you feel powerless. <laughs> yes. Right? It's true. So that's, uh, that's by way of um, excusing the following anecdote. Mm. Because, um, you know, it's always possible that I behave like a toilet bowl in these situations. Anyway, over the summer, right, I was doing a little bit of work at Teddington Studios, beautiful Teddington. And I would cycle there every morning. Uh, and at, right at the end of my cycle, I'd go across Richmond Park. There was a little bridge to get across the river to get to Teddington Studios, right? And it was a pedestrian footbridge thing. Uh, and... Basically, it was clear that if there were other people walking on the footbridge, the best thing to do would not be to cycle across it, right? Because mm. it was fairly narrow. So if there were people on this footbridge, I would always get off my bike and wheel it across. But then one morning I arrived at the footbridge, no one on the footbridge, right? And I was pretty late as well. So I just cruised right across. Uh, at, right at the end of the footbridge, a couple was just starting to walk onto the, the bridge so i slowed right down mm. like absolutely slow. how wide is this bridge i would say how, how wide is this bridge how wide is that like a meet two meters mm, yeah meter and a half. something yeah, like meter that and a half, yeah. yeah yeah it's decent you've got like park uh passing room for a bike and a couple to pass without any friction well no you'd have to i mean i would say I would you'd say have to give way. You'd have to give way, yeah. Mm. So anyway, so I I slowed right down and I I kind of pulled over to one side to let the couple pass, and then I carried on down. And there was uh, a young 
community police officer at the other end, right? And he's got all his gear on and he's got his mirror shades on and he's absolutely loving being a community police officer. And he's on his bike as well. So he holds up his hand. Stop, please, sir. And he must have been about, I mean, he was young, you know, he was like about 27, something. So he goes, uh, I think, oh, here we go. He goes, stop, please. Um, any idea why I stopped you, sir? <laughs> that old chestnut. You know, and you're like, oh, here we go. I can't believe it. So I was like, no, no, uh, no. Any idea at all why I might have stopped you there? And it's like, ah. Oh. I said, could you tell me why you stopped me? They shouldn't, they should be stopped from starting conversations like that, shouldn't they? Yeah. Because it infers it's such a patronising place to start a and conversation it's, it's from. absolutely infuriating. And I said, listen, I, I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm in a hurry, could you please tell me what I did wrong? He said, right, step off your bike, please, sir. And it's like, ah, oh, he's deliberately like, he knows I'm in a hurry, he can see I'm frustrated, he's deliberately like slowing everything down, making it as maddening as possible. So I get off my bike. I'm like, okay, can you, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry if I'm like a little jittery. I, I'm really late. I really want to go. Could you just please tell me what I did wrong? I can avoid doing it again in the future is what I said, right? So this guy says, um, got any ID on you, please, sir? Oh my goodness. So I get out my ID. I'm like, can you please, you know, can you please tell me what have I you, did wrong? Have you got a giant beard at this stage? Not giant, like a normal beard. Normal one, cool. Yeah. And he's still wearing his mirror shades. I said, can you take your sunglasses off, please? So he takes his sunglasses off, right? And he's looking at me. He's like, right. So, uh, shall I tell you why I stopped you? I was like, yes, please. That would be great. Uh, you were cycling on the footbridge there, sir. I was like, yeah, I was cycling on the footbridge. What's the problem? He said, There's no cycling on the footbridge. It's like, right. But, um, all right, I won't do it again. He's like, um, did you see the, uh, couple there, sir? And I was like, yeah, I did. They were right at the end. Like, well, you made no attempt to get off your bike when you were cycling across the footbridge. I was like, no, because there was no one on the footbridge. There was no one there. So I was not endangering anyone. You know, you made no attempt to get off your bike. I know, I just said I made no attempt to get off my bike because there was no one on the footbridge. Cut a long story short, he gives me a ticket. 30 quid. Is it a 30, 30 pound fine? 30 pound yeah. on the spot fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I said, I said, do you give like tickets to every single person you see on a, because uh, you see loads of people yeah, yeah, yeah. cycling on this footbridge, right? Even when there's a lot of people mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. I said, do you ticket every single person you see on a, on a bike? He said, no, I use my discretion. I'm like, Why do you use your discretion now for someone who cycled across the footbridge with no one on the footbridge? I wasn't saying it like that. You were thinking that. But I was thinking that. I wanted to throttle him. And I was thinking, I'm just going to get on my bike and cycle away. And there's going to be a bike chase. And I was thinking, uh, you know, I would, I would cycle off and I'd get into work and there would be this And it would end up in a film studio, like yeah. classic bike chases. That's and you'd right. be weaving between people in <laughs> costumes, carrying big props. <laughs> that would be ace. And I was thinking, could I lose the community police officer if I'm on my bike? And then I just thought, no, life's too short. It would escalate into a huge international manhunt. I just couldn't believe. I said, you are a disgrace. So this is, a, the subject of Text the Nation is... Run-ins you've had with... With uh, petty officialdom. Petty officialdom and authority of that kind. I, I had a similar thing on a train, which I'll tell you about. We're talking about security guards in shops, yeah. uh, community police support officers, real policemen, could we talk about that? Sure, anyone in a position of authority. Infuriating run-ins with... with with petty officialdom. Yeah. I had a very similar thing along the embankment on my bike uh -huh. uh, with two community police support officers cycling along a totally empty pavement and they pulled over in their van and told me to get off the bike. Yeah. I wasn't in the way of anybody and it was by a very dangerous main road. And uh, so I said to them, I said, God, this is, you know, this is really stupid and a waste of your time. <laughs> how did they respond they looked angry <laughs> they looked as if they're about to ticket me and then i said how much is is the fine is it 10 pounds because i've been thinking about it for a while i thought yeah. i'd just pay it you know i'd, I'd almost pay 10 pounds for the pleasure right of being able to cycle for you know like a ticket to cycle on the pavement yeah it's like only two pounds more than the congestion charge <laughs> They looked as if they were going to bust me, but then I backpedaled and went, but, you know, you're only following the rules and, and I'm breaking them, so that's fine. I and tried that. I tried to squirm out of my fine, but this guy was absolutely, you know, he decided that uh, Buck Lee's needed a ticket. I that's just, infuriating. And there was no Did you take his number? Because that's the thing to do after the G20 protests, right? When they were all hiding their numbers. Right. Now you go, I want to take your number and you write it down. I think I did that, but then I just... Take oh, can't be bothered. That'd give them the willies. Pay the flipping fine. So text us on... What's the text number? 64046. Uh, with your stories of run-ins with uh, 
officialdom, petty officialdom, security guards, any kind of person in a position of uh, power who abuses it. Now, here's a track from, is this guy called Mike Snow, but he spelt it with two eyes? Mike Snow. <laughs> is that right? Mike, probably. Mike Snow. This is black and blue. Mike Snow with black and blue. Joe Cornish, unprofessional, next door, as the song finishes... Here he comes. All right. What were you doing? Just getting some things. Getting some things. <laughs> some bath stuff. We got some good bath stuff. Oh, I printed yeah. it out. We were Look chatting about baths. And someone pointed out, We were. I was ranting earlier on about how I don't think there's any reason to have a meal on the pavement outside a restaurant. And I was speculating that it would be absurd to have a cocktail bar in a uh, public toilet. Someone's emailed and said, there is one up in sort of Hoxton area. But I don't think it's a fully functioning public toilet. I think it used to be a public toilet. They, they've converted into a bar. Mm, there's mm. a similar thing. There's a comedy club in Shepherd's Bush that's uh, similar to that, I think. Mm. But you can't have, like, weeing and cocktail shaking going on in close proximity. Well, but then our producer, James, pointed out that bars in pools, in swimming pools... Oh, yeah. There's probably a lot of that goes on. No, but it's if the, if it does happen, what you think people are sat there in the pool bar? Well, we were saying that you like when I relaxed. was young, the idea of a, a bar in a swimming pool seemed to me like the height of sophistication Certainly. and luxury. It'd yeah, be an amazing to be able. And to it is. Drink. I've I've been one of, in my on my honey, on my honeymoon. I was on, I, I've been in one. But then it was amazing. You could imagine that. I mean, James, our producer, was talking about one he went to, and there was a man sitting there, sort of propping up the bar, so to speak. And he'd been there a long time. <laughs> he was just a drunk. He was man. drinking a lot. Yeah, yeah. But it would be very easy just to let one. Sleep. Certainly, the temptation is not to get out of the pool and go to the lab. If it's a little. If the water's a little bit warmer around the bar, <laughs> <laughs> I'd go. To, I'd use the indoor one. <laughs> but we were asking about ambitious baths stuff you've tried to do in the bath you know just to make it a bit more interesting here's an email from vicky fabry in london uh my boyfriend early on in the relationship i was being moody so when i arrived at his house he said let's have a bath a fairly usual saturday night activity for both of us that usually involves the weekend papers special bath and they've got a big bath or do you think they just cram in together yeah, I mean, that is, in our bath, that would not be, be a tricky, good idea. A conventional bath. Anyway, when I went up to the bathroom, however, I found the laptop, my projector, and a bed sheet held vertically taut on two poles Whoa. so that we could watch a movie in the bath. I'm a big film fan. He generally hates them. This is already a pretty good feat in itself and an unusually romantic gesture for him. But on top of that, the bath didn't stay warm for long and we ran out of hot water. So my boyfriend got, no, it's not what you think. So my boyfriend got the camping stove, heated the camping kettle next to the bath and topped it up while simultaneously watching the film. He's the best boyfriend in the world. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And there was probably popcorn floating on the surface of the water Do you think as that well? would be nice, though, after about no. half an hour? No. It would be awful, wouldn't it? <laughs> Start being kind of horrible. Surely, because you'd get pruny and also you'd just feel weird, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think half an hour is probably tops for a bath, isn't it? Definitely. Watch some cartoons or something. Minutes. But committing to setting up a whole film with a projector yes. and everything. It was high mat as well. <laughs> <laughs> it was shower. <laughs> watching it in the bath. Here's another one about and ambitious they were baths. It in the bath. <laughs> From Jimmy in Glasgow. Twas in my lazy student days, and I was spending a Sunday afternoon relaxing in the bath. But relaxing meant taking the radio in so that I could listen to that afternoon's football match, as well as the TV, so I could watch one of those generic results programmes to keep up to date with all matches. And as it was Saturday afternoon listening to football, I had a few beers and smoked a few fags. <laughs> <laughs> in the bath. Is that classy? It's very, and we should remind younger listeners, it's very dangerous to bring electrical appliances that are connected to the mains into the bathroom. Obviously. I mean, that is absolutely <laughs> lethal. But that's a pretty impressive bath there for, for James. To say nothing of drinking and smoking, which is also extremely bad for you. disgusting. And we would never encourage it here at the castle. Right, uh, here's a free play for you now, listeners. This is the Pixies. They're going to be in town soon, playing gigs that are already sold out. I'm going to, And I've failed to get myself a ticket. I'm going to try and wangle my way in. Do you reckon I can do it? Yeah, you can try it. Do some wangling. Uh, this is from their album, Bossa Nova, and it's a lovely song that always makes me feel as if I'm on holiday when I'm listening to it. Havelina. Pixies with Havelina. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. It's just gone 10.30. It's time for the news. Good stuff. That's Heads Will Roll from the Yeah, Yeah, Yes. That's from their very good album, It's Blitz. Very that, good. That, that came out this year, right? Feels like it's been around longer than that. Well, it's such classic sound. It's an absolute classic sound. 
from that sound like they're from the path. It's one of the albums of the year. It's going to be topping yeah, the polls. One of my albums of the year. It's, so, on, it's on top of my poll. Is it? Regularly. <laughs> <laughs> is it spinning around on top of your poll? Yes. Um, that's going to be happening shortly, though, isn't it? It's nearly the end of the year. All mm. the polls are going to be coming out. Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. Uh, should we have some text nation? Sure. Text the nation. Text, text, text. Text the nation. What if I don't want to? Text the nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. Text the nation this week is all about run-ins with petty officialdom, Mm -hmm. security guards, people who've been given some spurious uh, type of power wherever they work or in some kind of public space and who try and... Well, sometimes uh, actual power. Yeah, no spurious, by law. Spurious. it's always spurious. <laughs> and yeah, who try and ruin your life by using it, right? Yeah, especially times where they perhaps wield their power unfairly and times where they could use their discretion and don't, you know what I mean? Mm. Here's one from Felix. I once got cross in B&Q when I realised a security guard was following me, so I began to follow him. Nice. That'll teach him to think I'm going to nick stuff, I thought. So we set off up and down the aisles. Ha! Deal with this, Mr. Guard. Eventually, he stopped, so I stopped too. Then he asked me if I was following him. Uh, no! Why would I be, I said. I was just looking for this. And I left and had to buy an attachment for a garden hose that I didn't have. What a bun hole. <laughs> Love from Felix. <laughs> That's quite good. They really annoy me, security guards in shops. Yeah. Because they do, they, they do a sort of um, biological t- determinism. Mm-hmm. Is that a phrase? Yes, it is. Where now. they just make a judgment on your appearance sure. and decide to follow you. It's future crime. It's minority reports. Right. It's like when the police film protesters at a protest just in case they do anything in the future. Uh-huh. I don't think it should be allowed. No. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the slippery slope physical profiling well you know that's like the sus laws isn't it i'm extrapolating quite wildly there from a minor incident in a record shop i like the way you brought in minority (laughs) report as well but that's a good way that's a very good way to turn the tables don't you think yeah do a bit of following i've done that myself yes it's not a good idea listeners why not (laughs) because it always ends in tears it ends up with you feeling like what do you think the best case scenario how's that going to end you know with the guy sort of saying listen i'm sorry uh i've realized now that you followed me that i uh, with him bursting into tears and stripping off his uniform (laughs) and saying i'm gonna get a proper job yeah yeah uh here is another one from i believe an anonymous texter I was once exhaustively upbraided by an officer from the transport police for the crime of aiming a kick in the general direction of the train I'd just missed. Despite the train being several yards away, I was apparently, quote, endangering life on the railway. No. (laughs) Just a random air kick in frustration. Sounds like it. That is classic. I would go absolutely ballistic if I got (laughs) upbraided on that one. (laughs) Here's one from Nate in Harrogate. I was in WH Smith's, other news agents are available, reading a magazine. I scratched my nose and then carried on turning the pages. She told me not to lick my fingers and turn pages due to health and safety. She, <laughs> I assume, is someone who works there. I explained, but she insisted I was lying and she said she saw me do it. <laughs> I was furious. <laughs> Being ticked off for t- scratching your nose, then turning a page. Well, sometimes, I mean, you're not really supposed to read the mags, though, are you? Oh, well, you read those news agents. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Cornwalls. <laughs> Cornwalls has gone bonkers. Uh, where are we? What day is it? <laughs> no, they, those uh, WH Smiths, they wouldn't have any business if you couldn't flick through the mags. Right, right. News agents, generally, you've got to be able to flick through the mags, but it's a tricky area. And they often come and watch you while you're doing it to make sure you don't take the free frisbee. A a brief flick is absolutely fine. I mean, that's a good Mm. rule for life Mm. in general. But But if a piece of bogey comes out. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's bad. Or some spit or drool. Yes. Falls onto the picture of Jordan. Yes. Then that's no good. The free CDs on most of those magazines, like Mojo, they're held on with bogeys anyway, aren't That's they? That's true. Yeah, industrial bogey. Industrial bogeys. Anyway, keep those coming in. Your run-ins with petty officialdom. 64046 is the text number. The email's adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk. Good news, Joe. What? It's Monsters of Folk time. Wizard. Here's Say Please. Monsters of Folk. That is their new single, Say Please, which is out on Monday. Their debut album, Monsters of Folk. Uh, was released this week on Rough Trade. It's quite a good name, can, don't you think? Yeah, Monsters of Folk, certainly. That's a nice cover. One of them looks like Peter Sellers. 
exactly like Peter Sellers with glasses and a little beard there. It's bizarre. Mm. Uh, you can catch them at Troxy in London on November the 17th. And the band consists of three... It's like a super group, right? That, hence the name Monsters of Folk. Mm. Three uh, members from three separate bands. Bright Eyes. Oh, there you go. That's why he looks familiar. That's Connor Oberst. But there's it? four faces in the photo. My Morning Jacket and M. Ward as What's well. going on there, James? The band consists of members from three separate bands. Oh, well, I see. So two, two of them are from one band. Two from My Morning yeah, Jacket, I think. Fair enough. And M. Ward. I like M. Ward very much. Mm. So there you go. That was good stuff, wasn't it? Now... Oh my oh goodness. I just cavalier I just threw my playlist over in a cavalier way and knocked over my bottle of water. Shall I lob it at the window now? No, don't lob it at the window. It's not that sort that of yobbish? show. That's yobbish, yes. Place it in the recycling. I really thing. want to lob it now. Give it to me. I'm gonna lob it at the why? window. Why why? I know it's just for fun. Cause I can. Uh, it's, it's no good, is it? It's not good. It's not right for this programme. You've ruined this programme. <laughs> you really have. Yeah, they even got some water on the window there. What's wrong? What's the matter with I don't you? know. I'm out of control. I feel alive. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the tube this morning, right? This is unrelated. But um, what's your favourite tube announcement? Can you think, <laughs> <laughs> Can you think of any offhand? Uh, no. I like, ladies and gentlemen, Blackfriars Station is closed for refurbishment oh, until classic. late 2011. 11. I like the way they give you a date. Yeah. In yeah, case yeah. you want to wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might just... I can wait. Well, it's useful for other reasons. All right. Late 2011. I'll just look at my watch. Yeah, I can wait. Uh, and the other one I heard was, Marble Arch Station is closed all weekend. This is due to planned engineering oh, works. Yes. It's okay. It's planned. It's all been planned. This is turning into a sort of a um, sort of civic moaning. Is it? Yeah. Is it? Fair enough. That's what you call them moaning shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like run-ins with petty officialdom. I know. I'm getting it all off my Tube chest. announcement. It's good, though. One weekend. You see, the I'm thing is... I'm just going to have some melon. Do you mind? Go on. Have your melon. You, ch you chat away. <laughs> the have thing is fun. that normally I'm on my bike, right? So I avoid all these things. I don't come into contact with too many irritating aspects of modern life. Mm. But I, I haven't got my bike because of my arms or mankaloid. So I've been going on the tube and stuff. Planned engineering works. No, oh, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, what I'd like to hear is someone saying, uh, sorry, we've closed the station due to some improvised engineering works. <laughs> And uh, uh, probably closer to the truth, I would imagine. Uh, um, um. <laughs> and finally, a bit of popopriation, which we haven't had for a very long no, time. that's true. Have we even got the jingle, James, just, just to pad this little bit out? No. No, we haven't. I didn't give you fair warning. That's fair enough. The next stop is Oxford Circus. Please remember to take your litter with you. When you hear that, do you not always sing a little bit of uh, Crowded House? Everywhere you go, you always take your litter with you. <laughs> yeah, you That's good. Don't you get that? No. Finished your melon? Yes. Got a free play? Uh, I do, actually. This is Della Soul. It's from the um, bonus disc of the reissue of Three Feet High and Rising, so it's probably a B-side. But it's a little conversation. And when was that album? 89? Three Feet High and Rising, 89, yeah. Yeah, it's a conversation between a child and the members of Della Soul about the values of hip-hop. Mm. Uh, yeah, so a little bit dated, but a curio. Oh, <laughs> delicious. <laughs> Here it is. Rick James with Super Freak. I keep thinking that he's going to do the chorus a bit more, though, you know? The Super Freak! Super Freak! The Super Freak! Hey! He doesn't really do it. He saves it up for the end. It's too sexy and overpowering. I like the way he sings. I think everyone should sing like that. I'm glad everyone doesn't sing like that. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we? What are we doing here? Oh, yeah, we're going to talk, gonna about, talk our... about our competition listeners. If you were listening. Our non petition. Yeah, if you were listening to the show last week, you might have heard us announce an extraordinarily exciting uh, competition mm. that climaxes at the electric proms that are happening here in London next month. And we announced last week. Uh, a competition that, and the prize of which was for you to join us on stage at the Electric Proms. And it's a kind of a karaoke thing. Basically, yeah. what we wanted you to do is send in little uh, audition tapes of yourselves singing along to a couple of our Song Wars songs. We've uploaded uh, instrumental versions of Joe's Quantum of Solace song and my Nutty Room song on our blog. And the lyrics are there and everything. So all you have to do is sing over the backing track 
video yourself doing it send us a link to the site yeah and uh, and you could be in the running to join us at the electric what could prompt. be simpler what could be simpler but listen uh, to what happened listeners so we launched this last saturday uh yesterday adam and i Here, got emails from our happened. producer nothing nothing ever. not a single entry <laughs> <laughs> Over the six days that have elapsed, not one person Fish. in the British Isles has decided to film themselves karaoke no. karaokeing our song wars and send it in. But before you think, well, that's no surprise, you, you two are a couple of idiot holes, and what kind of idiot hole would no enter your idiotic to your competition? Show anyway, you we had a, a far more creative competition last year, was it? Uh, our video wars competition, where listeners had to actually make a video for our song wars songs. And we got... Well, hundreds would be a lie, but over a hundred entries for that. Yeah. So we know we do have very creative uh, and inventive listeners. So we're trying to figure out what's gone wrong with this competition. What have we done wrong? Joe's theory was that maybe people that listen to this show and feel moved to get in touch with us are not sufficient. They're not like exhibitionists people. They're not like that. That came out wrong. Yeah. But they're not like X Factor type people. You know, they're not like song and dance maestros. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel for them. I'm, I'm not a big fan of public performance no. either. I like being on the radio, you know, where I just imagine no one's listening. But the idea of getting up in front of an audience and uh, performing yeah. terrifies me as well. And I think maybe a lot of our listeners are artistic types who like to you know go back into their burrows and, and express pri themselves in other media yeah yeah rather than bear themselves that was problem number one snag number two it this event happens during the day on a weekday do you really think that would have put people off yeah because if you're at school or if you have a job right or you don't live in london you cannot participate i see were you to win yeah yeah so there's less motivation right, right? so so those two things combined and um, is it complicated for people to video things and upload it to sites? No. No, it's very easy. That's easy. So that's yeah. not the problem. No. So, listeners, we're hoping that by telling you that nobody has entered. Five years ago, we would have lied. We would have, have, yeah, we would exactly. have made up some people. We, we would have, have said, uh, the competition's going really well. We've had a well over 60. Oh, that's some very funny stuff coming in. <laughs> so uh, keep those entries coming in, and uh, we'll announce the winner. And then we would have faked up like one guy. We would have got a friend of ours to do it. And we would have said, the winner is uh, Timmy Michaels. Congratulations, Timmy. Slipped can't can't him. we still do that? We slipped him a five. Why can't we still do that? <laughs> we would have faked up the whole thing, taken some pictures. Wouldn't be a big problem. Not now. I can't do that anymore. We have to do it for real. Damn. So if you're not going to help us out, we're going to end up looking like Wallies. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to end up looking like Wallies anyway. Yeah. The whole thing's going to be a big explosion of Wallidism. Here's one thing, right? One incentive. Look at it this way. Mm. It's very, it's at the moment, very easy to win this competition. Yeah, that's the thing. It's an open <laughs> goal. No one else is even playing. Yeah. So all you have to do is carry the ball over to the goal and set it down and you've scored. You've scored. You get to hang out with us uh, in the whole afternoon. We're going to have this fun party at the Electric Proms. <laughs> Don't laugh like that. It's going to be, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it as well. I'm just wondering how exciting that would be for people to hang out with us wow. in a fun party. No, but it will be fun. Yeah, it's going to be, be fun. fun. I'm going like to try and good. cash in my neck to points i don't know the if points party i think i'm going to try and do the points party i think there's a lot of interest in the event yeah there are people that want to turn up uh, to spectate but in terms of people who actually want to perform a song war song uh -huh. zero nothing nil we're going to do a little show joe and myself are going to sing some of our song war oh, songs yeah i'm committing to that all right i'm definitely going to do that you, yeah. you can back out but um it's going to be fun so come on folks don't be shy i'm probably going to be away the oh, week yeah. before yeah. yeah so i'm probably gonna have just like landed you can in MC. a plane the day before no i'll do i'll sing maybe dr sexy sing dr sexy we'll bring some videos along it'll be fun we're gonna have a fun time so and don't be on. don't be scared if you're a shy listener don't be scared we'll be very supportive we'll sing with you mm. we'll help you to the loo and up onto the stage exactly We'll spoon feed you baby food and stuff. So go to our blog right now, bbc.co.uk slash blogs slash Adam and Joe, and find out more. All the details are up there. Everything you need to get involved. Uh, don't be shy. It's going to be fun. Music time right now. This is LCD Sound System with Daft Punk is playing in my house. Was it? Go, go down. I go down. I go down. 
That's LCD Sound System. Daft Punk is playing at my house. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Joe, did you see the conclusion of Alone in the Wild on Channel 4? I didn't. I've seen none of it. And we were talking about this three weeks ago when the, sh- when the series kicked off. I was under the impression that it was going to be like a six-part series. I mean, that's normal. How many parts was it? Three. Yeah, there's a lot of three-parters. Is there? The choir was three parts as right. well. The choir unsung town. Uh-huh. Which I've been enjoying, but yeah. And what anyway. what's the deal? Do you think they they get halfway? Do you think they're shooting for a series, but they haven't got enough stuff? They just or is don't want to a... commit. They don't want to commit. Six is a big commitment. If it's a flop, then they're stuck with it. Do you know what I mean? They yeah. have to. They have to move it around the schedules. Just cowardliness. Cowardliness. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the deal with Alone in the Wild though was surely. I mean, I might be totally wrong. I don't know about this, but. Surely they were shooting for a longer series, like a six-parter or something, hoping that they would get a lot out of this guy. And then he pressed the emergency button. Ed, yeah. But by programme three, it was just wall-to-wall sobbing. Mm. I mean, I had a point to make anyway about the amount of crying from men on television, which is getting way out of hand. Mm -hmm. Did you see um, on Thin Ice, like before we went off for our break, Ben Vogel... And James Cracknell, and the show was called On Thin Ice. And yes. Was they, Fogel himself crying? Yeah, everyone was crying. Yeah, yeah. Fogel did a lot of crying. Well, Fogel does really push himself. He was seriously ill at one stage, wasn't he? He got frostbite on his nose. No, but he was properly seriously ill. He had some weird wasting virus or bug that he caught oh, in really? the jungle. Yeah, do you remember? He, I think it was pretty serious. Oh, dear. So he's very vulnerable, generally. He is. He shouldn't go out into the Arctic, then. He loves it, though. He absolutely loves pushing himself. Or does he? Because he spends most of his time sobbing. Like, it doesn't take much to set him off. But in, on, on Thin Ice, Ben Fogel, was, he was very worried about... He got frostbite on his nose, right? I'm really worried about my nose. I can't stop thinking about my nose. I'm so worried about my nose. Cut to Fogel with massive bandage <laughs> over his over nose. nose. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, long shots of... Uh, he would get upset because Cracknell was a bit of a bully. He would bully the other random guy. Cracknell? Sarah Cracknell? No, not Sarah. Uh, James. Uh, I don't Is he a rower? James Cracknell? Something like Some sports figure. They got him out there. And there's all these people going out into the wilderness, into mm. the extremes. You know, generally men, young men in their 30s or 40s. And it's hard to tell why they're doing it. I think there was some charity connection with Fogel on Thin Ice. I'm not sure about that. There's absolutely no question of it being a charitable adventure or venture for Alone in the Wild. Was this a a castle production? uh, On Thin Ice, I think, was a big British castle thing. Uh, Alone in the Wild was Channel 4. Right. And there was no question about it being charity. It was just about this guy pushing himself, Mm. testing Mm. himself. Mm. Ed, he was called. And he went out there to uh british columbia i think crying's um, fun though it's good for men to cry but he was crying non-stop mm. literally non-stop throughout the whole really? literally by the third program all they had left presumably to make this show was footage of the when guy was the last time you cried uh i was close to it last weekend when uh with the elbow with my elbow really yeah. hurting but i didn't i didn't actually sob i cry when i watch the choir unsung town Do every you? week like a little baby right because it's so moving yeah the, the sound of like do you ever see that james the producer wonder if any listeners watch that program with gareth the hermaphrodite choir master <laughs> he's brilliant and he's got this whole, uh, what's he called, South uh, Oxley. He's got this whole town doing a choir. Uh-huh. And there's something terribly moving about different people from different walks of life. It's a bit like the Retro Text the Nation jingle. Sure it is. Different people of different ages, children, old people, black, white, yellow, all singing yeah. in, a, in a beautiful noise. Inspiring stuff. Really inspiring. You know what, I was it's, close and to And it's tears. a real weepy. They've got it. They've really nailed it. Yeah. I mean, it's not just simply, it's a sort of classy X factor mm-hmm. in that everyone's got a story. And then everything is, cath- you know, the, the the singing is hugely cathartic and everyone sobs. And it's finished now, is it? It just did the third one. Yeah, well, well we watched it recorded. So it was out on Tuesday nights. So I think last week they did the last one. Ah. Very powerful. But I cry happily. I love it. Do you? My face really contorts. I like trying to hold it in. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom lip goes. Do your throat hurt? I spasm. Yes. Very painful throat. Yeah. yeah. But then I love it when it when it finally gushes out. Wow, you let it gush out. I do. <laughs> oh, good. Do you make sounds? Uh, no, because I'm usually <laughs> sitting behind do you cover my your girlfriend face? and I don't want her to know. Oh, sure you don't. Because she's on the floor, I'm on the sofa. I don't want her to know. Oh, it's quite good, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <damn> it. <laughs> stupid program, stupid program. <laughs> 
a very soppy program. Do you want a biscuit? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, Gareth. I don't know what gender you are, but I love you. <laughs> I think he's LaRue's sister. Do you cover your face when you cry? Uh, not unless she looks. <laughs> <laughs> Ed Wardle was not covering his face no. at all. And when he was alone in the wild, he was in the Canadian wilderness there and everything was setting him off. Mm. I mean, he was physically at the end of his tether, right? He'd been out there for 50 days. He was very hungry. He's malnourished. So I'm not saying he had nothing to cry about, mm. even though he was out there for no good reason. Uh, but he was absolutely sobbing. And then he got like, he got letters. They are, th- that thing they do on, I'm they a celebrity. always do that. Yes. Yeah. Letters some, from your family. Had some letters. They do he... that on, sorry to keep steamrolling. They do that on, on that channel four thing. Yeah. Uh, shipwrecked. That sets them off every time. It really does. They have to hand them to a friend to read. Picture of the girlfriend. <laughs> picture of my girlfriend. Are you Dear sh- Suki. He shows we the are picture. Missing you so much at home. Tommy made his breakfast and said, where's Suki? This I can't read it. You read it. And then he goes at the end, they'd slipped a picture in that he didn't expect. Picture it like a picture of himself as a little boy with his mum. <laughs> I didn't expect this one. I just pray. Picture of my mum. <laughs> Sometimes on Shipwrecked, the person's only got to the island the day before when the letter comes. <laughs> and it, they still break down. Yeah. I mean, letters from Mummy are very powerful anyway. Sure. Handwritten letters from Mummy and Daddy. But he couldn't stop crying. And then eventually, when he pressed the emergency button and they airlifted him out of there, mm. Mm. he called time on the whole project. Mm. And then cut to f- him filming himself in this little hotel room, crying. Crying in the hotel. I'm sat in the hotel room. Do you think we could do that? Say, I'm... Um... Looking at a chair. This is pointlessness at the telly. I'm eating a chocolate bar. I've just come from the most beautiful place in the world. <laughs> What's the point of it all? Sobby. <laughs> I like the sound of it. I think it sounds w- wickles. <laughs> I'm going to do a version of it, I think. I want to think of whose mother we can get in touch and get her to write an emotional letter mm. and then surprise them with it. Someone someone you'd never expect to cry, like some hard-as-nails newsreader or somebody. Right. We could just slip them the letter. Philip Sturton. Phillips, St- Phillips, Edward Sturton. Edward Sturton. Yeah. F- Phil, uh, yeah. Something to think about anyway. Flaming Lips time. It's this Flaming weird song. Lips. It's, uh, do you like, can you remember this one from last week? Yeah, I quite enjoyed this. Quite enjoyed it. Let's love it. it Absolutely listen. love it. Silver Trembling Hands, it's called. Well, it's good, isn't it? Basically. That's uh, Silver Trembling Hands with the Flaming Lips. They've made an effort to make it sound different and they, they are, should be applauded. They should be applauded. I'm going to applaud them right now. Well done, Flaming Lips. That's out on the 12th of October, taken from their latest album, Embryonic, which is released in the same week. They're touring the UK from the 10th to the 17th of November, incidentally. And the video, fun fact, for I Can Be a Frog, their follow-up single, is available to watch online now. And it features Karen O from the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs on backing vocals. Cool. It's Let's all coming uh, together. have some Text the Nation fun. <laughs> Text the nation. Text, text, text. Text the nation. What if I don't want to? Text the nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. And it's all about run-ins with petty officialdom this week. Here's a text we had from Carl with an E. How would you say that, Carl with an E? K A. Carle. Carle. When at school, aged 15, the police saw me cycle on the pavement going home for lunch. They flashed their lights. I ignored them. On the return journey, I was doing the same when the same police car went past. Rather than immediately stop, they continued past and into school. Uh, they were chasing him at this point. They drove over four pitches to cut me off at the pass. No way. I dumped my bike and they chased me into school <laughs> and read me the riot act. All a bit over the top, considering said path is now a cycle path after the road was deemed too dangerous to cycle on. I was a hero for a day and actually was clapped by 1,500 school children who had chased the car through the school. <laughs> observations on how dangerous the police car was at 30 miles an hour in the middle of the school <laughs> fell on deaf ears from Carl. that's like a scene from a spielberg film that's or something insane isn't it that's fantastic carly is a dude <laughs> here's one from mr kidney in glasgow he's not is he a mega dude do you think he's well no he would have said he was if he was a mega dude mm. he's just maybe he's just Carly. modest I bet he is a mega dude. I was given a £50 fine by the litter enforcers in Glasgow when my three-year-old son dropped some crisps on the pavement. 
By the time they'd finished writing the fine and given me a lecture on parenting, some pigeons had eaten the crisps. Well, the actual crisps, not the packet. Yeah, that's what Mr Kidney is saying. Where are these people, the enforcers, where... They're just terribly When you bored. need them. You know, when people are, like, brazenly throwing packets on the ground and stuff like that. They don't go up to those people, do they? Just target the people who aren't really doing anything. It's, it's broken Britain. Here's one from Karen. Hi, Adam and Joe. I was in a zoo in Mexico City looking at a giraffe. The security guard said I wasn't allowed to view it from that position. <laughs> I had to move two metres to the right. I replied that it wasn't difficult to see the animal from whichever position. He wasn't impressed. Wow. That's high levels of official officiousness, isn't it? I'll tell you Mexico what it is, John. City? I'll tell you exactly what it is. PC gone mad. It's PC gone it's mad. PC gone completely mad. <laughs> there he is. PC hello, gone PC gone mad. mad. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone mad. PC gone mad. I'm a photographer and come up against petty officialdom a lot more these days. The moment I take out a camera on the street. The worst was in Paternoster Square near St Paul's Cathedral. Other squares are available. <laughs> I was photographing a businessman for a business magazine and decided to take a couple of shots of him walking towards the camera from about ten metres back. The man had a few minutes left before having to leave. I have a camera on a tripod and a bloke in a private security guard get-up, complete with bright yellow jacket and walkie-talkie, stands in front of my camera. Yeah. He said I could be doing hostile reconnaissance <laughs> and won't move. Now, this is a big deal, right, because lots of professional photographers have signed a petition saying that police in general are... Uh, abusing um, anti-terrorism laws. Exactly. To stop, and it's, a, it's actually a big deal amongst the photographic community, and rightly so. you're not allowed, because generally the pavement is owned by the council, right. and they're allowed to refuse you the right to but take But that's photographs. ridiculous, isn't it? And that's the kind yeah. of thing that the entire country should take up pickaxes and flaming brands and just kick, kick out whoever Russell tries brands, to do that. <laughs> Joe Brands, they should pick them all up and Definitely. sort them out. Uh, isn't there, there's another good one here. I was in Morrison's buying a Gabby Logan workout DVD, £2 bargain basement. I got to the checkout and the cashier dude noticed, just a dude, by no, the way, mega dude. noticed there was no age certificate on the DVD <laughs> and started rambling that he should really ID me for the item. But Come uh, on. Uh, maybe I wasn't the age you should be. Maybe they shouldn't be selling the item at all. Saucy Gabby uh, Logan. <laughs> I explained that it was a workout DVD, not <laughs> hardcore Gabby Logan porn. You never know. I like reading that phrase. He then proceeded to discuss the issue with every single worker at the store. I left. I'm 26. Claire, oh, for in Oxford. goodness That's sake. That's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> That's unbelievable. I would have gone absolutely ballistic at that point. Can I read you one more? Come on, then. Final one. This is from Ben. I was outside Leeds train station. Me and my girlfriend were arguing loudly... Uh, not loudly in the station. I'm not sure what it was about. All of a sudden, a community support officer walks over, demands my ID. I refused and asked him what right he had to interrupt my conversation. He looked shocked, then asked me to remain where I was. I replied, you're going to go and get a real policeman, mate. Oh, nice. You're arresting me or detaining me. He said back that he was detaining me. However, he knew. He, however, I knew he had no right to. I decided to try my luck and run for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the bit I like. With his girlfriend? <laughs> no, wait for it. He chased... I dived down the steps that led to the multi-storey car park, ran under the railway bridge and dived into the nearest pub. I sat there with a pint of Tetley's, other oh, beers are available, while I watched the community support officer continually pacing around the surrounding area trying to find me. My girlfriend was even more angry as she was detained and questioned by the police. <laughs> oh However, she didn't give my identity away. In retrospect, I was a bit out of order. That is a disastrous afternoon. How are you going to get over that? That's going to take a lot of... <laughs> I like that they're dumping the girlfriend in it. That's, there's a certain amount of courage. <laughs> Running away from the community police officer to get a pint. Don't you think it takes gets courage? Because <laughs> he's got to face her when he gets home. I mean, that's braver than, that's braver than dealing with the officer. Yeah, I guess. These are good. Anyway. Thanks very much, listeners. Here's a free play for you right now. This is one of those songs, and it's by The Pogues, that I believe is a guaranteed floor filler in whatever situation you happen to find yourself in. Even if it was like, it wouldn't matter what age the people on the dance floor <laughs> were, they would have to get with this song at some point. It just... Uh, is it Will Smith with Getting Jiggy With It? It's Will Smith with The Pogues Wicked. version. No, what? it's not. Although that is one of those songs. Mm. Getting Jiggy With It is one of those songs. Don't Stop Till You Get Enough by Michael Jackson is one of those songs. This is... The Pogues with Sally McLennan. Uh, happy memories from when I was a cop in Baltimore. We used to listen to that at the end of a long day. Mm. Me and the guys, when we'd been busting heads, mm, mm, when mm. we'd finished doing that. What's that a reference to? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm thinking of that Scorsese film with Leonardo DiCaprio. It's the kind of thing that all cops do. They do it a bit in The Wire. They listen to the Pogues in The yeah. Wire. Irish American. Yeah, that kind of thing. Coppage. Cops love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. But that is an absolute smash of a song, though, isn't it? Um, and we just played it here on BBC Six Music. This is Adam and Joe. And, Joe, I'm handing over to you for this. Are you? Yeah. Well, okay, okay, okay. Look, I've been watching a lot of telly recently, Have right? Have you? And uh, do you ever find people saying cliched things that you wish would happen literally? Mm -hmm. Like in makeover shows, uh, there was a makeover show I was watching this week, and they keep saying uh, places have got the wow factor. Yeah. They go on and on about the wow factor. But the other thing they say is uh, this woman led a potential homeowner into a room, and she said, it's got potential written all over it. <laughs> yeah. And I wished for a moment that they went into the room and the word potential was scrawled in blood all over the walls of the room. Do you know what I mean when you wish that something would happen literally? Yeah. There was also, there was another example of that. Why does is, it have um, to be scrawled in blood? Well, because it's, uh, you know, it's a play on the word potential and the type of madness that would lead someone to actually write the word potential in blood. Yeah. You know their potential has been squandered in some horrible way so much so that they've done a killing <laughs> and then written it in and that's what's happened in the house. Do you know what I'm getting at? Sure, yeah. Sure, sure. You know, it just evokes a lot of dementedness. Mm -hmm. Dementia. The other one is uh, there was a famous review of um, uh, Imelda Staunton's performance in the film Vera Drake that said Imelda Staunton's performance literally screams Oscar. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that one? Yeah. And I just wish that would happen literally as well. Oscar! <laughs> in the middle of the film. <laughs> that would be like a Stephen moment. Yeah. I know, it would be good, wouldn't it? Well, a little bell that would go off. Yes. They did that in Protocol, do you remember? Yes. Well, that was just when they mentioned the name of the film. But, I mean, that was fairly literal, though, wasn't it? Because sometimes, that, you know, that was a fairly literal mm. translation mm. of that feeling mm. you get when you hear the name of the film mm. in the film. And when someone sort of says it. Yeah. yeah. That's all I've got, to be honest. Is it? That's all I've got. I just, I just wrote those two things down. I was trying to help you by talking yeah. about protocol. You were doing program. well, but it was sort of straying out of the uh, area. Well, it was subject. It, it was being literal. Well, I don't really know what when links Goldie those Horn two things that says I said. Protocol and the little bell goes off. I think it's when someone says something stupid that you wish would actually. What happen. about this, Joe? What? <laughs> um, well, well, like well, you started off talking about the wow factor. What was that? I don't know. I was just trying to get myself relaxed. How about the word zhuzh? This has got the wow factor. The word zhuzh? What do you zhuzh. mean? I mean, when people say the word zhuzh. Oh, zhuzh something up? Yeah. On those makeovers. This needs to be zhuzhed up. Yeah, like a pile of zhuzh. Is that, can you have a pile of zhuzh? Well, this is what I'm saying. Well, is zhuzh an action or is it a thing? That's what I'm talking That's about. That's what you're saying. Isn't it a new drink? <laughs> it could be a new zhuzh. drink. Zhuzh. It should be really, shouldn't it? Or a band. A pile of zhuzh, a bag of zhuzh. Where does zhuzh come from? I think it comes from people's bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> this is Adam and Joe. More than one person. Yeah, a number of people, they collect it. <laughs> um, it's 11.30, it's time for the news. What a fantastic sound. Teenage Fan Club with Sparky's Dream. It was released in 1995, taken from their album Grand Prix. Sparky's Dream got to number 40 in the UK charts. Smooth. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Let's have the made-up jokes jingle, James. I'm a funny person, I often make up jokes My jokes are more amusing than those of other folks When you hear my joke I think you'll find that you agree Come on, you're all invited to a made-up joke party If you're a, a new listener to the show, this is a an irregular section Irregular because it's kind of difficult, you know, to listen to and to read out a section of jokes sent in by our listeners. And we kind of demand that they're made up, they're actually authored. And it's very difficult, actually, to tell or test whether a joke is genuinely authored. For instance, one of our favourite ones, uh, my dog Minton ate a shuttlecock, bad Minton, is apparently a Tim Vine joke. No. Somebody sent in an email saying that, you know, we were really enjoying that joke for weeks on end, thinking it was the top of the tips, and it had been made up by a brilliant listener. Timmy Vine. Turns out it's a Tim Vine joke. He's a joke machine, that guy. So it, it, it's hard, you know, there's only a limited amount of wordplay, and there's lots of people. Chest to nuts. make it. Boasting <laughs> in an open There was that foyer. whole incident. The one joke we've had that we think is genuinely authored was the Annie Linox. Yeah. One. And Neil and You'll know what we're talking and about Neil if you're a regular Knox. listeners. Now, I don't think and anyone Neil else had made that one up because it was just so <laughs> tortured and convoluted. So that's kind of what we're looking for. Jokes that are so 
peculiar and tortured they could only ever have been authored by the listener i still like some of the simpler ones and what i've done is i've just entered the joke into a search engine right to That's see a good it, test. to see That's how many hits test. pop up and so these ones i've tested that way really and they haven't That's popped a good up. test uh, like i'll give you an example right mm. here's a simple joke that made me chuckle that i couldn't find any reference for on on google this is from james hewitt i think he's a regular contributor um how much do they pay to play sport at hogwarts now mm, yeah 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 yeah. well yeah do you want me to say go on then uh, a quid each correct a quid, it's a quid each <laughs> It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. But I just can't help thinking that would have been made up on the set of Harry Potter that's, 1. That's why I don't care if it was made up on the set. But it's a question of whether it's proliferated. Right. And so I've put it... Uh, but is, I, it then, is it a made-up joke? I put it into Google. He, I believe that James made it he up. He made it up. Yeah. It was just... Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, good, good, good. <laughs> I'm backpedaling, good. <laughs> what have you got i've got uh this is somebody called katie rogers from london here are a few jokes my boyfriend Tarek has made up recently he's immensely proud of them and i promise to try and be more supportive of his creations i'm only going to read one of them out because the other one's too awful it often happens that couples submit jokes on behalf of the other member of the couple yeah know? we're doing a it's a sort of marriage support service sure. we're doing here what do Mos what do mozzies yeah. Eat for breakfast at Harrison Ford's house. Oh. The Mosquito Toast. Nice. You see, now that's probably made up, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's a bit rubbish. Because it's a little lame. It's a little bit lame. But in a very sweet way, that's like good. a little lame boy. And it's a reference to a sort of good, obscure film. <laughs> it's not that know? obscure. Here's one from uh, James Wright in Cheltenham. He says, I came up with this whilst buying some bike bits for my girlfriend. Here we go. What do you call a cycling rapper? Panier West. Oh, you yeah, know, that is what you call them. The it's, cycling rappers. That's technically, that is what you call them. Yeah, yeah. He says, come on, read this out, make a long-standing fan happy. Job done, James! Thanks. Hi, Adam and Joe. I made up this joke over the summer, but have been reluctant to send it in, as it hasn't received any laughs as yet. That's my favourite. Anyway, here goes. Did you hear about the recent competition where you could phone in to win clothing for large predator cats? <laughs> the competition has ended now, though. When you try calling the number, all you get is an automated message saying, the lions are now clothed. <laughs> Josh from Rygate. That's very good. P.S. Just in case it's not clear, which is highly likely, <laughs> the lions are now clothed is meant to sound like the lines are now closed. <laughs> put that in as a P.S. I like the explanation. That's brilliant. Here's one, and this is a very, I mean, this is a slick joke, but I believe he mm -hmm. made it up, mm -hmm. right? I'm trusting him. Mm. Julian Rawlinson from Warrington uh, says, Why did the specials, the band The Specials, feel so bloated after their Chinese takeaway? Too much foo, too much foo young. Nice. Too much foo young. Do you want to hear a really long tortured one? Yes. Here is a really bad joke that my friend Kenny has been working on since he heard a documentary about Constantinople on Radio 4 two weeks ago. It's undergone several incarnations and has involved a great deal of blood, sweat and tears and searching of Wikipedia to get it to the polished perfection it now stands at. Here we go. What did the leader of the Ottoman Empire say when he ordered that his favourite sweets be renamed to Starburst in order to commemorate the renaming of Istanbul? <laughs> <laughs> Tim Vine doesn't tell this one. I don't know. Punchline, OK? Now, don't expect to get this immediately. Punchline. I can't stand an opal fruit. All right? OK, now don't worry if that's not funny, because listen... Constantinople. Obviously, the humour comes from the fact that the, that opal fruits were renamed Starburst, an historical move that mirrored the renaming of Constantinople as Istanbul following the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Just as the leader of the Ottoman Empire can no longer stand Constantinople, he can no longer stand opal fruits. Kenny is worried that this joke is so obvious that it has been made before. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure that's not the case. <laughs> What did the leader of the Ottoman Empire say when he ordered that his favourite sweets be renamed Starburst in order to commemorate the renaming of Istanbul? I can't stand an opal fruit. I'm Michael McIntyre, good night. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one more from Ga uh, Gareth Davis. He says, uh, and again, starts conversationally, which I always enjoy. Did, did I tell you I had a problem after my flight from Argentina? 
A musician was playing in my bloodstream. Turned out I had deep vein trombonist. Ooh. <laughs> Hope you like it, says Gareth Davis. <laughs> I mean, that's probably made up, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. it's barely worth saying. It. It's barely worth <laughs> saying. I mean, it's wasteful on so many levels with the world in crisis as it is. I mean, anyway, listen, keep your made up jokes coming in. Uh, you can email them to us or text them. The text is no, you can't text them. Don't text them. The email is adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk. And please make sure you only send in genuinely authored jokes. Well, find out if not. Mumford and Sons right now. This is Little Lion Man. That's Mumford and Sons with Little Lion Man. This is Adam and Joe on BBC Six Music. Uh, uh, coming into the last 12 minutes of the show, so just time to read out some final Text the Nation entries. Are we going to do the jingle? Text the Nation. Text, text, text. Text the Nation. What if I don't want to? Text the Nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. Text the Nation all about ridiculous officiousness from petty, uh, what, what would you call them, officials, security guards, policemen, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, just round it off with a, with a couple. Here's one from Ed Pentalo. My girlfriend, aged 32, was refused the sale of a pizza cutting wheel thing at Morrison's in Wood Green. <laughs> she was visibly bemused, so the cashier reminded her of the knife crime issue in the area. Oh, my Lord. Do you, could you damage someone with a pizza slicer? Yeah, you definitely could. I mean, you wouldn't be allowed to take a pizza slicer on a plane, would you? No, you wouldn't. But uh, if you were injured by one, it would be quite easy to stitch the bit back in, wouldn't it? You could just use the cheese to... To, to bond it. Reattach everything, yeah. Yeah. Hot cheese. Or just fry it up, make a fleshy pizza. Be delicious. That'd be revolting. Here's another one from Ray Wake. Hi, once I left my watch in a swimming pool changing rooms, when I phoned up to ask the person in charge of lost property if it was there, I described the watch in detail down to the fact that the face changes colour when one presses the small button on the right side of the watch. He said, yes, we have a watch matching that description and... Hang on. Gap while he fiddles with my watch. It does change colour. Oh, how clever. When I said, great, <laughs> thanks a lot, I'll come and collect it, he said, mm, hang on a minute... How do I know you're the true owner? You could just be anyone phoning up asking for a watch. I said, well, because how would I know there was a watch with a button on the side that changed the colour of the face in the changing room? He said, well, it could be a coincidence. Please tell me the product code written in tiny writing on the back Shut of the watch. <laughs> when I explained that I clearly had no idea what this number was, he said, well then, in that case you'll need to bring a photo of you wearing the watch <laughs> if you want to get it back. He was entirely serious. <laughs> oh my goodness. And then finally, to cap it all, this is from Matthew in London. I was once in, Det in the Des Detroit Institute of Arts looking at the collection. I was quietly chewing on some gum, minding my own business. A museum guard silently walked up to me and handed me a piece of paper. It said, chewing gum is not allowed in the Detroit Institute of Arts galleries. After reading this information, you may use this piece of paper to place your gum in. <laughs> <laughs> That's polite, though. That's kind of neat. Just a neat one to round it up with there. Absolutely. Thank you very much for all your texts and emails. And if you're listening throughout the week, you can email us with more of your run-ins with Petty Officialdom for Retro Text the Nation on the weekend's show that's coming up. Yeah, the email is adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk. Quite a bad bit of talking I did. That was good, that was good. Yeah, thanks a lot. Here's a free choice now, Joe. This is yours. Yeah, I was uh, watching, for one reason or another, a little bit of Donnie darko do you know that film sure i do it's a big cult movie no one knows what it's on about but you know yeah. it's really s exciting. darko that's the one to see though that's the sequel oh, it's apparently amazing have you seen that no, why <laughs> would i it's apparently a toilet cake yeah, isn't absolutely it? uh anyway uh, and it, they, he uses in that film this track by tis for fears head over heels he does do like a that whole sequence? new video more or less doesn't yeah he? it's really fantastic one of the best i don't know quite why it's so fantastic but this song really works really well in the context of high school and it's kind of over melodramatic and it's, mo it's kind of lots of images of cheerleaders and stuff like that and kind of walking across the school precinct, you know, being stared at and There's stuff. There's a lot of slow motion, isn't there? Yeah, really good. Uh, and I always think of that sequence now when I hear this song. But here's Tears for Fears with Head Over Heels. <laughs> Line. That's Tears for Fears with Head Over Heels. That's it from us this week, listeners. Thanks very much to everybody who's listened, everyone who's emailed and texted. We'll be back at the same time next week, 9am till noon, here on BBC Six Music. 
Stay tuned for Liz Kershaw. She's coming up. Don't forget that we've got a podcast of this show, which is available and it's enjoyable and it's got little little extra sprinkles on there as well. It's it- available and enjoyable, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed and some snot came out. Um, we'll be back with you, of course. Uh, I was going to say the podcast comes out on a Monday evening. Um, so check, Sometimes earlier. Check it out. Sometimes even earlier. That's exciting. Keep pressing refresh all weekend on your iTunes or your other MP3 conveyance device. Have a fantastic week, listeners. Don't forget to check out our blog to find out more details about how you can join us at the Electric Proms. And we look forward to being with you again next week. Bye-bye. Take care. Love you. Bye.